Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and a warm welcome to the 2021 Annual Meeting for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. My name is Audrey Bollier, co-coordinator of the Alliance. And my name is Hani Mansourian, co-coordinator of the Alliance. We're very pleased to start the 2021 Annual Meeting with you all. As we prepare the event, we notice some amazing data. A new record of 94 abstracts were submitted this year, over 50% of which will be presented throughout the week. We would like to thank the 26 experts who volunteered their time and expertise to help us in the selection progress. This year, we will have additional sessions, especially on Tuesday and Wednesday mornings CET, European time, to allow colleagues in different time zones to benefit from the presentations around prevention. We have also had an increase in registration compared to the previous year, and years actually, um, with over 1,600 people expressing interest to join this event. This is one of the positive aspects of having events online, as it allows a wider participation from colleagues around the world as they don't have to travel physically. But virtual meetings also have their downside. It is harder to meet people and get to know about their work outside of the agenda of the meeting. We have tried to compensate this with the setup of a virtual coffee lounge, which can, can be accessed through the main page of Philo where you entered uh, today. Uh, please explore the virtual venue and enjoy meeting old and new colleagues. We have tried to offer a menu à la carte, a French way to say pick and choose what you fancy, especially with the number of thematic presentations. Please take a look at the agenda and choose as many of them as you want. We will also have a few important sessions, such as the fifth anniversary of the Alliance, followed by a social event on Tuesday. We will also have the introduction to one of the most important pieces of work we have recently concluded, and that's the 2021-2025 Alliance strategy. It has been a year in process, which has started during our, annual, our 2020 annual meeting. Many of you might remember the consultation that we did last year during this event. Now this strategy is ready. On Wednesday, 6th of October, we'll be launching uh, or learning about the strategic plan, its overarching goal and its objectives. And that's when you're gonna get a copy of it in your emails. Ooh, exciting. And then to end a fruitful week, we will have the pleasure to hear from our working group and task force leads about the work of the Alliance. And believe me, they have put together some lively and informative presentations. So please be there on Thursday. And finally, um, as the world is facing more and more challenges with climate related crises, we have decided to start reflecting on our work in regards to the role of the child protection sector in combating climate change and its impact on children. We will have all of Friday, the, the 8th of October, dedicated to this discussion with inspiring speakers, engaged youth activists, and some great examples of work already done in several contexts. Now a little bit about the thematic focus of this year's meeting, which is prevention of harm to children, as you know. To quote Joseph Mallon from the book of uh, his book from 1895, and the name, the title of the book is The Ambulance Down the Valley, quote, to rescue the fallen is good. It's best to prevent other people from falling. Better put a strong fence around the top of the cliff than an ambulance down in the valley. Prevention was a secondary priority in our 2018-2020 strategic plan. It also emerged as a priority area in our consultations for our 2021-2025 strategy. The Alliance has been working on this topic for a few years now, and we are proud to say that our technical work, as well as our advocacy, is starting to bear fruit. We are seeing more systematic inclusion of prevention in programming on the ground, as well as in organization strategies. This year's annual meeting is our opportunity to further discuss this important topic with all of you, our community, and to make commitments to ourselves and to the children we serve, that we will do all in our power 
to prevent harm from happening in the first place. While we continue strengthening our response to the consequences of abuse, neglect, exploitation, and violence against children, we will work to address root causes of harm to prevent unnecessary child-family separation, recruitment into armed forces and groups, children entering into child labor, early marriage, gender and sexual, gender-based and sexual, uh, sexual violence, and many other negative outcomes that children in humanitarian and fragile settings have to endure. In other words, a week rich with learning, but also surprises and emotions. We hope you will be with us engaging with the presenters while staying as much as you can away from your emails. Now, moving to our first speaker of the week, we are honored to welcome the UNICEF Executive Director, Mrs. Henrietta Faure, for an inspiring open statement. Thank you. On the occasion of its fifth anniversary, I want to congratulate the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action for its impactful leadership. I am delighted to open the 2021 annual meeting. At UNICEF, we believe that every child has the right to grow up free from violence, exploitation, abuse, neglect, and harmful practices. That is why child protection is a cornerstone of our work. Across more than 150 countries, we work with governments, businesses, civil society organizations, and other partners to prevent violence against children. We support survivors, including with mental health and psychosocial counseling. We also work with communities to end harmful practices like child marriage and female genital mutilation. Our work spans both decades of a child's early life, from birth to adolescence, in development and humanitarian settings alike. UNICEF has recently finalized its new child protection strategy that features prevention as a cornerstone of our work for the next decade. The progress outlined in this strategy demonstrates how far the world has come in recent years in protecting children. With welcome increases in birth registration and reductions in child labor, child marriage, and female genital mutilation. But as we celebrate these achievements, we are clear-eyed about the challenges ahead. The impact of COVID-19 is likely to put our hard-won gains at risk. The evidence presented in this strategy reminds us that too many children are still living their lives without the systematic protection they need and deserve. We are already predicting sharp rises in the number of child marriages, child labor, and girls subjected to female genital mutilation. We must not accept this. This strategy provides a vision and a strategic framework to meet this challenge. It calls upon every sector of society, not just governments, to work together and invest together to prevent violence against children. This includes expanding preventative and responsive healthcare services, violence prevention and case detection, and mental health services, all delivered at the community level. It includes ensuring universal access to safe schools, especially as education systems reopen following the COVID-19 pandemic. And it includes putting child protection at the heart of economic plans and priorities as countries fight poverty within their borders and rebuild systems shattered by the pandemic. But our work must also be about changing minds in our families, homes, and communities. Progress on violence depends on making some fundamental changes in social norms, attitudes, and behaviors, particularly towards girls and women. We can no longer accept a world in which violence is a reality for millions of children and women, keeping them from the safety and the opportunities to grow, learn, and thrive. Protecting children from harm is not only the moral minimum for any society, it represents the only path to a better, safer, and healthier future for children and for our world. I am excited to see that prevention features strongly in the brand new Alliance strategy as well. Therefore, I call upon the entirety of the child protection sector and other sectors to join hands to advance the sustainable prevention of harm to children. 
thank you uh, to Mrs. Fore to take for having taken the time uh, to do this video and to share with us some very inspiring uh, works. I will now hand over to Hani uh, for the uh, keynote panel. Hani, the floor is yours. Right. Thank you very much. Um, and I would like to invite our panelists. Um, I believe all of them are here. Farida, uh, Dr. Rutkowski, Santi, Stella, and Ken. Hopefully um, my colleagues can spotlight everyone on, on the stage so we can begin. Um, so as, as colleagues are being spotlighted, I will just begin by um, kind of inviting everyone to introduce themselves. So I'll just begin with uh, Farida, who is a 23-year-old youth activist currently living in Stockholm, home, Sweden. She's a refugee from the Democratic Republic of Congo who lived in Kiaka, number two refugee settlement in U Uganda for five years. She lost her family at the age of eight, married at 13, gave birth at 15, and became a widow at 17. All of these gave her the courage and the passion to draw and, and the drive to try and bring change to the life of other children and women. Farida, may I invite you to tell us a bit more, more about you and your work, and also give us one, of, one thought that you may have about the topic of, of, the, of the meeting, which is prevention of harm to children. The floor is yours, Farida. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. As uh, moderator introduced me, I'm from Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, it's Chakatu, not Kyoko. <laughs> it's a Chakatu refuge settlement in Uganda. Um, I was said to, uh, before I, I become a refuge from my own country, as you introduced me from the conflict uh, country, I lost my mother and at the same time I that uh, I became a child marriage, first marriage. And I left my sweet home, my house and my friends and my schooling. So I went, to, I went to live with my uncle. That is where I endured sexual abuse, which was like a torture to me. And I was forced to marry at the age of 13. Then I got, I got pregnant and deliv delivered at the, my son at the age of 15 with a lot of physical complications. Uh, I was always scared many times. I was not sleeping at night as a child and I wished the conflicts to end. I wished for my mother to come back so we could be together again and I, I could go to school. And again, the conflicts attacked me when it killed the, the father to my son. By then I was 17 years old and I became a widow. I fled to Uganda Chakat Refuge Settlement. There I found my brother and I started my work with the vision group. And for us refugee youth, the desire to prevent child protection concerns and protect children comes from our own individual lived experiences. Young people who have been through these experiences and play a big role in reducing violence against children. So with the vision group, we do different works on child protection and uh, working with young people still in the community to say that we protect our community. We train them skills. We give them uh, trainings on self-care and we use our own experience to see that we give them hope in the community. And today's plenary, uh, it's the hope we're trying to bring in our community to bridge the gaps between the local communities and the global level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farida, for sharing all this. Um, and next speaker, uh, Dr. Rutkowski, is the global director for social protection and jobs overseeing the World Bank global practice responsible for protecting poor and vulnerable from shocks through improving their job opportunities, earning capacity and social insurance and social assistance safety net coverage. 
Um, Dr. Rutowski, uh, Rutkowski, and I, I apologize if I pronounce anyone's name wrong. Um, uh, I would like to invite you to, to tell us a little bit about, uh, more about yourself and your work and share one thought uh, about the topic of the meeting, prevention of harm from children. Thank you very much, uh, Hani, and uh, thank you to all of you for thinking of uh, the World Bank uh, and thinking of me, thinking therefore of the social protection sector in the context of the, uh, of the Alliance um, for Child Protection. I feel very uh, proud and honored to be invited here. Um, uh, we do a lot of work on um, uh, social protection, in particular on social assistance, and a lot of work on prevention, especially through our human capital project, which very much focuses on investing in early years and building resilience in young individuals carried then throughout the lifetime. I think that uh, social protection in general, but cash assistance, which so much increased in the pandemic time, are extremely important uh, in dealing with root causes of harm to children, and especially in the context of uh, fragile, uh, fragile uh, states and fragile areas. Uh, we know very well from both our research and the research of so many present in this virtual room that children are twice as likely as adults to live in poverty. And young children are in particular very vulnerable uh, and therefore opportune uh, at this stage of human growth and development. The way I look at the linkages between the child protection, especially through prevention agenda and social protection, uh, I think it lies in three areas. The first is protection against poverty. The second is promoting access to core services notably services related to nutrition, health and education. Uh, and third, in supporting children along with their parents and caregivers. This particular risk I referred to of children in humanitarian and fragile contexts is very high on our, our mind. We devote more and more of resources in social protection to those contexts and within that to, uh, to children. And from that context, I'd like to say something, uh, something which I think is important, which is to welcome the growing rapproch rapprochement between humanitarian assistance and publicly provided social protection. Historically, historically often uh, the, those two areas were thought of as very, very different. Um, humanitarian being immediate, quick, urgent, um, and then social protection being essentially development, long-term institution building, state capacity building. But the increasing number of and severity of shocks, which pandemic emphasizes so much, shows that it is this view is no longer valid. We've known that uh, since the, the Istanbul summit in 2016, but the coordination between humanitarian assistance and social protection is absolutely essential for, for three reasons. First, to leverage and strengthen core tools essential to service delivery, especially including early warning systems, but also on our, uh, on our side, social protection, social registries and identification and payments platforms, which we, which we have seen huge, huge growth uh, in, in, in recent years. And those countries that had those social registries and payment platforms developed prior to the pandemic crisis benefited from that by their ability to uh, roll out uh, new social assistance programs quickly, especially in the urban informal sector with huge benefits going to families and children. Second, to ensure adequate coverage and what is very important, avoid uh, any duplication of efforts. And finally, of course, we want to work together to maximize the efficiency and impact of resources. So again, I think it's so good that you invited me and the World Bank, but us as representing social protection world to, uh, to your uh, Alliance Summit. Thank you for that. Over to you, Hani. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Um, the next speaker that I would like to introduce is Dr. Santi Kusumanin Grum. Again, I apologize if I butcher anyone's name. Um, Santi is the director uh, and principal investigator at Puskapa. Center for Child Protection and Wellbeing, a think tank based in Universitas Indonesia. 
Um, she's also an adjunct assistant professor for population and family health and, uh, at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University and teaches at Criminology Department of Universitas in Tunisia. Santi, I would like to invite you to tell us a little bit about more about your work um, and also a thought about prevention of harm from children. Thank you, honey, and thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, a little bit more about what I do. So basically, I manage a think tank, uh, honey has mentioned, uh, Puskapa. So it's a, a 40 or so people. Now it's 40, more than 40 people now. Uh, and together with everyone in my team, we basically do five things. We do research, we turn those research into policy proposals. We persuade people in power to take them up <laughs> and we help them implement those through two, I think two main approaches. One is providing them with technical assistance, both national and subnational governments, and also to uh, uh, help them in doing program setup or, or piloting uh, of the, uh, some of the solutions we proposed and got, got bought in. Uh, and lastly, we build alliances with uh, other organizations who do uh, services on the ground because we cannot do everything, but we uh, collaborate with uh, a lot of different NGOs. We also uh, build alliances with NGOs who provide litigation services, case by case litigation, because working in the issue uh, in, in issues like this can actually uh, make you be in contact with the law yourself. Uh, the third is we also work with a lot of campaigners, so uh, organizations who mobilize uh, public pressures to the government. So that's what we do. And everything is under one agenda and it's reforming Indonesia's care and protection system, vital registration, because uh, I would echo what Michael said before about the importance of having everyone registered and having a legal identity document and make sure that no one is off the statistical map and um, reforming Indonesia's data governance and lastly, reforming access to justice. My thought about prevention, honey, <laughs> I think I would uh, maybe congratulate uh, everyone who wrote the position paper that will be discussed after this session. And I agree with uh, everything that's uh, argued there including uh, the work of prevention should operate in at least two levels, uh, preventing something bad to emerge and preventing the negative consequences of the bad things. But I think I would like to offer something that has been sort of bothering me, especially since the pandemic. And I think what is remaining missing from the conversation about prevention is whether the crisis lo is local but shared with the rest of the world, like violence and harm against children is never unique to one country. Uh, and on the other spectrum is whether the crisis is truly global, affecting every country almost at the same time, the pandemic, for example. And when it, it is the latter, including the imminent climate apocalypse upon us, what can global humanitarian do, honey? Who helps whom? And how can there be truly global primary prevention of adversity, exclusion, and injustice? Those are my thoughts. Thank you. Well, wow. very profound thoughts and questions. And I don't think anyone will claim to have an answer for that. But I think this help this week's discussions will help us kind of get closer to uh, to having an answer. But I'll I'll reflect on those. We we have reflected on some of these questions, but. Uh, uh, it's a, it will make for a very long and hopefully interesting conversation to be had. Uh, thanks, Santi, uh, especially because I know you're joining late at night. Um, our next speaker that I would like to introduce is uh, Mrs. Stella Ayo Odongo, who is a child rights and child protection social policy expert. She recently joined the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children and oversees the pathfinding work in ending violence. And previously, she led the African Partnership to End Violence Against Children. Um, Stella, I would like to invite you to tell us a little bit about your work and yourself and share a thought about prevention. Thank you. 
Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here and specifically to focus on a subject that is slowly gaining ground and that is prevention. Um, like Hani has said, I work with the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, which is a, a global multi-sectoral platform that brings together multiple stakeholders to build a movement around preventing and responding to violence against children and preventing prevention being central to the work that we do. And I'd like to say that um, for me, the, the, the movement building has been a journey that I have lived and worked ever since, maybe let me say I've lived and worked ever since I was 13. And uh, my, my role in movement building probably was informed by the experiences when I was 13 years old and ended up in exile in Congo. And that was as, as a result of the conflict that was happening in the northern part of the country. Thereafter, I became a researcher and as a researcher, again, came face to face with the issue of, of deprivation as a result of conflict. And that was looking at the, the role, how, how quickly girls drop out of school as a result of, uh, of lack of uh, facilities and sanitary facilities. And then as a practitioner, being at the front line distributing um, um, handouts to people in the camps in Northern Uganda. So building movement has been part and parcel of what I have been doing. And so the experiences that, that have brought me to this level have been gradually built on that. Speaking about um, prevention and the theme of this conference, I think for me, it is the fact that we are now narrowing the lens on what Honey started with. And if I remember the quote, correctly, it's about the ambulance sloping down and whether we should build bridges to stop in from falling or what we, we should do, what we should do. Probably pro we should look at stopping the ambulance situation from happening at all. So for me, that is uh, my understanding of what we should be debating. And I'm hoping that by the end of this week, we should be able to come up with a solution. But at a, as, at a global level for us, prevention is central because um, it's better to stop it from happening than, ha than, than waiting to, to fire fight. And uh, it's always said that humanitarian setting is complex and, mar and always mars our thinking because as practitioners, we focus on the now and forget the need to stop it because we are all in the mud, in the weed, in the forest and we, we, we get lost. So it's important for us to step out a bit and look at how we can stop it from happening. I'm excited to be here and I look forward to sharing my reflections on that. Thank you, over. Oh, thank you, Estella. Um, I'm glad you brought up that, that the forest uh, analogy because it's, it's really, it is really about stepping out and, and a lot of us who are humanitarians or consider ourselves humanitarians, we, we get really stuck in that kind of the, the churn, like constantly trying to, to respond to urgent needs that are, that are there in front of us. A child is, is already separated, a, a child is already recruited, and it's hard to step back and say prevention is actually possible. So thanks for bringing that. I look forward to discussing that more. And last but definitely not the least, Ken Ondoro who is a child protection researcher with Child Resilience Alliance. His research focuses on strengthening community-based child protection systems through strengthening linkages between the formal and informal systems. Ondora strongly believes that with empowerment and innovation, communities have solutions to their own challenges and problems. And uh, Ken is probably only a few kilometers away from where I am in Nairobi. I, I assume you're also in Nairobi. Karibu, uh, Ken. I would like to invite you to, um, to just tell us a little bit about yourself and your work and a, a thought on prevention, please. Uh, thank you so much, Hani. So my name is Ken uh, Ondoro, a researcher with the Child Resilience Team. I'm glad to be uh, part of this uh, global meeting. And uh, I think for, for us at Child Resilience Alliance, I think protection has been the core of uh, our interventions and we strongly believe that uh, communities have the abilities have the knowledge and have the uh, the systems to be able to identify and respond to issues that uh, affect affect uh, their children so 
I'm glad we are talking about protection here because this is something that we've been uh, passionate about. We've been trying to communicate out there and we've been trying to share with the child protection sector that it's actually possible uh, to trust communities to, to, to address uh, issues that affect children, that it's actually possible to also entrust communities with the abilities to be able to respond to and effectively prevent violence uh, to children. So the core of our intervention is, uh, uh, and the question that we try to answer is, one, what role does the community play in, in child protection? Are they re recipients of uh, our projects as the global child protection uh, uh, sector? Or are they partners uh, in the process of uh, addressing issues of child protection in the community? And uh, one of the pilot interventions uh, that we've done uh, have shown us that communities actually have the ability, they have the knowledge, they have the skills to be able to intervene on issues affecting children. And we communities are also a good source of learning for us as child protection uh, practitioners. It is true through uh, our experience that there are certain things that uh, even being a child protection expert, we have learned a lot from, from the community and the actually things that we actually didn't know with regards to child protection. In our intervention, we trusted the communities to be able to identify harms to children, to be able to come up with activities uh, on how to address those issues and to be able to strengthen their own systems. Our role was just a facilitating role uh, to try and facilitate communities uh, towards a certain direction. But the direction was identified by the community and the communities decided how and when and what to do to, to, to protect children. So I'm glad to be part of this. Uh, I'm happy that we are uh, now talking about more prevention as opposed to, uh, to protection. And uh, I hope uh, going forward sharing uh, our experiences will be uh, valuable uh, uh, for uh, the child protection system. So thank you so much, Hani. I'm, I'm glad to be uh, here and to be on this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. And Ken, it would be great if, if it's, there's possibility for you to shift uh, your computer such that there's more light coming from the window because now it casts shadow the other way, actually. Um, yeah. but it's hard to see you when you have light coming from behind you. Great, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really honored to be um, moderating this very diverse um, panel, both in terms of where we work and where we are located, but also in terms of, uh, in terms of the topic that we, we work on. Um, and as Mikhail was saying, we were very kind of intent to make sure that we bring those elements of other sectors that, that work to protect children, including, for example, social protection, um, to make sure that we don't only get stuck in our own bubble of child protection and, and also kind of um, broaden our horizon, given the inter intersectorality that is embedded and the multi-sectorality that is embedded in the concept of, of prevention, especially when we talk about primary prevention and addressing root causes. I have a set of um, questions, two questions, two questions per, um, per panelist. Uh, I'm just going to ask the first questions for uh, basically one-on-one -on -one to, to everyone. It would be great if panelists can um, keep their answers to about 90 seconds, again, give and take, uh, so that we will remain with some time for uh, Q&A. So again, I'll go back to Farida as our uh, first speaker. Farida, what do you see as the role of the youth in preventing harm to children, particularly those affected with income, those, are, those who are in conflict and fragile settings? Uh, thank you, moderator. Some of us have been there trying to survive. We know prevention is hard work. As young refugees, we feel a need to impact and transform the lives of those we love and the communities we live in. We are using our experiences to generate energy and voices for change. And our own experiences, vulnerabilities and capabilities are driving our work. It is very important to recognize the collective efforts of young people to increase child protection. 
The vision group works at multiple level to prevent child protection concerns at Chaka 2. We support and empower young people, especially girls out of school and child mothers through music, dance, drama, education, and livelihood activities. We also intervene with families to convince them not to have their daughters marry. I listen directly to child mothers to understand exactly what they need and then find ways to help them. We work to keep girls in school, even if they are young mothers. We go to schools to speak to children so that they accept and not bury those who dropped due to early teenage pregnancy. For girls who are out of school, we give them skills training and support on writing and public speaking. Most of all, I help them to not lose hope. Finally, we work with children to support mental health by providing a safe space with no discrimination so that children can feel included and heard. The vision teaches young children to make good decisions about not dropping out of school and how important it will be for their future. We support children to develop their dreams. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Farida, for that uh, very interesting reflection. Um, Dr. Rutkowski, what do you see as the role of social protection and cash assistance in addressing root causes of harm to children, particularly in humanitarian and fragile contexts? Thank you very much, Hani. I see three elements here, uh, starting with, with, uh, with the prevention. If uh, Our role is very much about promoting access to core services, notably in nutrition, health, and education. And uh, promoting access means that first access is possible. So development of those services is critical that they exist and they can be utilized. Second, within this uh, category is incentives to use them. And one of the classic example of the debates we are having is when we have massive cash transfers, do we attach conditionality related to children going to school, children having health checkups and so on. And we increasingly see that if availability of services is there, and if there is a proper information campaign, uh, conditionality may not be needed. So we are moving from conditionality to unconditional cash transfers. However, that all can only be debated if there is a possibility to access those services. Services. The second is everything we do is about poverty, about protecting against poverty. We uh, are for universal social protection eventually, but starting with the poorest and more vulnerable. So we do targeting because we need to start with the most poor and vulnerable. But when we observe a situation where there is a systematic correlation between number of children in the family and poverty, we would support and we did support universal child grants or universal uh, benefit that uh, uh, goes to children. Uh, finally, it is the, 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 the point I need to make is that particular challenge is uh, for the role of social protection is in the humanitarian and fragile context. I already uh, talked about that. And here, uh, really, really, the, the key issues are, are, are early warning systems and uh, identification of payments platforms. And that needs to be done together between humanitarian agencies and social protection providers uh, and, uh, and us in the World Bank. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um... The, the point you, you raised about um, access to, to services reminds me of, actually, I, I worked in the Congo for a while, um, and some of our research was in, in the issue of accessibility versus availability. Um, and we're very kind of adamant to make sure that you don't just make services available, but, but you have to make sure that it's accessible from the perspective of the community, because we may think that it's available because it's there. But if uh, three months of the year, floods basically block the, the path, even if there's only a kilometer of distance, then you're, you have the availability, but you don't have the accessibility. Um, and also the topic of uh, universal child grants really kind of touches upon one of the core elements of this, this meeting, which is primary prevention at the population level, that you basically, when you identify root causes, you, you address 
um, some of the elements that you know are key in preventing harm at the population level um, at a no regrets basis, knowing that you're going to, to basically reap the benefits um, at a later stage. Thank you for those. Um, I will go to Santi now. Santi, how can we ensure that national systems, particularly those in crisis and fragile settings, are designed to prevent harm as much as they're able to respond to harm that has already been done? Okay, so uh, I'm going to be speaking uh, based on my very limited experience and experience and knowledge from Indonesia. So. Uh, forgive me for that, but I believe that the number one thing that we need to do is to agree on what is the root cause of those harms. And uh, just like the position paper uh, argued. And uh, for example, I believe that one of the root causes of harm is uh, structural exclusion. And that's why the responsibility of people like me is to be able to provide the evidence uh, that can provide the the government with the complete picture of how exclusion happens, both the pre-existing ones and as well as the ones resulting from or amplified by the, the more recent political economy realities. And to me, uh, to be able to provide that spectrum of evidence, you need to recognize that what I call the three layers of exclusion. The first layer is exclusion uh, because children and vulnerable individuals do not have access to primary services, that is health, education, nutrition, social protection, housing, all the ba basic necessities for their uh, life and survival and thrival. And the first layer is usually happens due to poverty, remoteness, hence immobility. So that's the first layer. The second layer, if you imagine your society does not have any problems with access anymore, there will still be due to decentralization at the national context, uh, difference of quality and capacity and accountability of services. So there will always be children and vulnerable individuals who are dealing with uh, irresponsive services who cannot address the specific needs of marginalized groups, for example. And on the third layer, if you don't have any more problems with access, all services are standardized and at the same quality, there will be children and vulnerable individuals who are being persecuted and discriminated against due to their social identities. And this is gender, age, abilities, religion, ethnicities, race, uh, and as if you see this layers as like a stack over one stack over the other, um, as you move to the access part, I think we have done better with evidence. We can now show more population-based uh, data on poverty, for example, on inequality based on geographical uh, locations. But as you move down to discrimination, the evidence becomes more and more anecdotal. The challenge is in making sure that you can sell your anecdotal data because anecdotal data can also have rigor, but sell that to those who are making decisions. And that's from me, honey. Great, really, thank you very much. No, I mean, that issue of the structural exclusion is, is extremely important and it's, it's so easy to overlook because we often tend to, again, in the humanitarian world, you often tend to go in, look at, look at things very briefly and, and very easily miss some of those structural issues that that can really hinder the work that you're doing. For example, the issue of quality that that you were mentioning, again in the work that that I did in, uh, in, in on the issue of accessibility versus availability, it was very interesting that what the community would consider as the as as true quality was completely different from what we we thought are are the elements of quality. Um, and un unless you include that in your in your program design, you you may think that you have created something that is accessible, available, and of high quality. But in reality, the population might not access it because they don't consider the quality that at the same way that that we do. Mm -hmm. so thanks for that reflection, um, Ken. Um, I would like to ask you about. Um, of course, the issue of community-led initiatives. And given your background in, in, in those kinds of initiatives, 
how would you describe the role of communities in identifying and addressing the root causes of harm to children? Over to you, Kenny. Much better lighting, thank you. We can't hear you though. Sorry, uh, thank you, Han. I'm actually, I'm actually in the field, so I'm struggling with the internet. I'm struggling with the, uh, connection. I'm not in Nairobi, so kindly bear with me. Uh, thanks for that question. So for me, having been at the center of community-led uh, approaches. And uh, sector, we often see communities as the center of problems. And every other negative thing that happens to children is within the community by the community people and facilitated by the community. But we often uh, don't step back and look at the positive side or the value of, of communities. So uh, for me, uh, communities play a critical role in, in leadership. And uh, given that space uh, to lead in their own intervention, uh, uh, sometimes facilitated by external uh, interveners adds great value and plays a critical role. Uh, uh, communities taking the lead in uh, child protection interventions is one of the greatest uh, roles that communities um, uh, play in a community-led uh, process. And the reason is that they have the knowledge, they have the experience, they know where it hurts in the community. They are also the owners of um, uh, the protective systems that exist within the community. And so, and they know how to strengthen those systems that exist within the, the community. They might need the external support, but they have to take the lead in, in, um, in the intervention. Thank you, honey. Great, right. thank you very much, Ken. Um, and, and again, thanks for joining despite the difficulties. Um, I'm very glad that you uh, you also raised that the very critical terminology of facilitation because I think that's that's very key in in the way we have traditionally engaged with communities, which may not have always been with the role of a facilitator, but more of a role of humanitarian um, actors coming with money, with power, and they try to basically dictate what uh, what needs to happen, whereas that the true solutions probably sit within the communities, as as you rightly said. And now moving on to Stella. Um, Stella, what do you think uh, needs to happen in terms of advocacy to put prevention at the top of the agenda of different governments? And given your experience uh, in, in Africa, in the African partnership to end violence, feel free to specifically talk about that about the continent of Africa or, or globally, up to you. Thank you very much, Hani, and thank you all. I, I will build on a lot of what my colleagues, the panelists have talked about, but just to start from a point of view that uh, the responsibility to protect rests with government. And we need to acknowledge and recognize the children's rights and their protection from violence and any form of violence actually rests with the government. And then government has the duty to uphold and, and ensure the realization of this right, whether in emergencies or not. There is a tendency though for governments, and this is really with due respect to all that are on, in attendance, to step away in situations of emergency and leave that role to the humanitarian actors. But then as stakeholders in the space of violence prevention, we have a responsibility to hold government to account and say, you are the key duty bearer. You are the primary duty bearer. This is the, for you the first line to, to be to, to, of, of, of action. And you have a duty to, to implement uh, your obligation as a duty bearer. Now, having said that, for government to be able to undertake that role, the advocacy then spins out in our role in making violence prevention, especially in humanitarian context, at the center of conversation. First of all, profiling the issue, because if 
if increasingly we nudge, increasingly we talk, increasingly we raise the issue, then um, government will be able to take action. And this advocacy must be backed by evidence. We can only act and, and cause change when you're able to adduce evidence. And this evidence emerges from, from uh, communities such as uh, Santi was talking about. It emerges from Ken's community where we, we generate what document what is working, what the community's experience are. And as I said earlier on, what the lived experiences of children are, bringing it to interface with the government stakeholder for them to begin to see that it, the, the, the centrality of actually profiling or prioritizing the issue of ending violence. My second point is once we have provide, once we have profiled and we have brought the evidence, we have generated the data. The next level is to use that evidence to then drive the conversation towards, uh, towards action on the basis of the evidence that we have. And that would include talking about in investment in that sector. That it doesn't just happen, but it has to come from demonstrated models that have worked. What have the stakeholders on the ground been able to show? Even those in the community with the little resources that they have, what have those small movements been able to show about what has worked? And using the promising practices, using what is evidence to be able to cause that action to happen. And uh, my, my last point is that uh, to ensure that um, um, uh, violence or prevention of violence in humanitarian setting becomes center of the work of government. Again, a step to the role that we are playing at the global level. At the global level, we're now promoting and encouraging countries under the pathfinding module to develop plans of action to prevent violence and to prevent and respond to violence against children. I also know that there are humanitarian plans of action. The challenge that we have is that this, all these plans of actions are not speaking to each other. One is there's need for us to integrate the issue of prevention of violence in the context of humanitarian setting within the broader violence conversation. And then speaking to governments to ensure that these actually make their way into the national development plans because that is when resources and finances can be prioritized and allocated and appropriate for this action. So I think our advocacy role relates to in increased investment, our advocacy role relates to holding governments accountable for commitments they make on behalf of children and then causing them to actually demonstrate this by deliberately putting in place mechanisms to, to implement the commitments they make. And then thirdly, to ensure that we systematically integrate violence prevention into and especially children on the move, children in refugee settings within the broader national development framework. Over. Wow, thank you very much, Stella. So much, so much gold there. But I will just pick on the on the topic of, of evidence um, and the importance of evidence, having a strong evidence to be able to, to advocate, um, mostly because in child protection in general, we struggle with, uh, with generating good evidence that can be used in advocacy. But now on top of that, prevention by nature is a harder um, not to crack in terms of evidence. So now within protection, having prevention as, as an element that we have to build evidence around is extremely important and we have to be very systematic about it if we want to maintain this as at the top of the agenda. I'll go through, um, with thanks to, to our uh, panelists, I'll go through a second round of questions, but hopefully this round much faster. Um, I invite everyone to try to limit your response to a minute. Uh, and even though I would like to comment uh, on, on the amazing responses that you'll give, I'll refrain myself so we have time for Q&A. Back to Farida. Farida, uh, what can child protection actors, this community that are here, do to support the protective role of peers in preventing harm to younger children at the time of crisis? Uh, thank you, Hani. I think they should listen to young people who are working to protect children and work with us. It is time to see young people as agents of change and recognize their leadership potential and their uniqueness, expertise that they bring because of their own experiences. Connection can do wonders. I believe in community-based solutions. Often the former humanitarian actors like international and national NGOs can't be in the community in the evening or on weekends, but young people are there. They know what is going on and they use their experience and organize themselves to support 
and protect children at risk. It is important to connect with and support the children, the child protection work that young people are doing in their communities and the networks they are building globally. For example, young refugee leaders with experience as leaders and advocates have come together to form the Global Refugee Youth Network, GREEN. GREEN is a refugee youth led organization that works globally and supports the groups like the vision that are reaching out and empowering vulnerable and marginalized girls and boys to live with equity, dignity, and opportunities to realize their full potential. Partner with us to support youths, to support other young people, to protect children at the community level. Thank you, Han. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Rutkowski, how can child protection act actors and social protection actors work together more systematically towards preventing harm to children? What might be some challenges and some opportunities that you see in doing so? Yes, uh, that uh, as we discussed, the crisis really propels up to propels us to further strengthen collaboration between social protection and child protection. Uh, I think that um, the crisis has left children at risk from disruptions in access to school and essential health, health services to risk of malnutrition or orphanhood, given the concentration of uh, pandemic deaths on adults uh, and also to abuse given the rise in domestic violence and child marriage. So from a social protection standpoint, I would highlight what we do, which is what we call the cash plus care model that provides an opportunity to partner with child protection uh, agencies. Uh, because in that model, first cash transfer programs provide a platform to reach vulnerable households. Uh, they are often targeted to the poor or used uh, to reach specific vulnerable groups, which is also a, a sort of targeting to, to the poor and most vulnerable. But then second, uh, the evidence from rigorous evaluations really reveals the clear impacts of cash transfers on increasing access to health and education services and reducing poverty. Uh, but what we also see, and that's the core of what I wanted to say, but perhaps most importantly, we see that when cash is combined with care in the form of parenting support, especially, these impacts, impacts of cash can be boosted significantly. And recently we've gone through a, through a wave of rigorous evaluations, notably in in Colombia, in Madagascar, in Mexico, and in Peru. And those evaluations show that the addition of parenting support to income transfers resulted in significant impacts on children's development. And this children development was measured by a vector, including language, cognition, and social emotional skills. And we have very recent, recent studies in that topic. And to me, this is a prime example of, of child protection actors, social protection actors working together in the cash plus care context. Thank you and back to you, Hani. Thank you. It, it would be amazing um, if, if you are able to share some of those results, if they're published or... Yes, they are. Terrible. There is an Ariagada study 2018 and data uh, and others 2020 and I send you the, the links. Fantastic. And we'll share it with the participants. Thank you very much. Um, now, Santi, given yes. your work on turning evidence into policy, which is one of your expertise or one of the five that you mentioned, <laughs> uh, where do you think the main gaps are in terms of evidence that can support prevention sensitive policies across different levels of governments and systems? Hmm. Uh, I think it was interesting that you mentioned how child protection as a sector always struggle with the lack of data. I'd like to counter argue that by saying, I don't think the problem is the absence of data. I think data has becoming more and more available. <laughs> the problem is I think the completeness of the data. And um, if you want to tackle, if you want to argue for a prevention program, then somehow you also need to be able to produce evidence around, okay, so what is the population level prevalence of risks then? And then that becomes a problem of uh, whether our data is complete enough. And I'd like to use the Violence Against Children survey as maybe a reflection of that. 
And I think as you know, we are all happy with the fact that now we have methodologies on measuring prevalence of violence against children, but still uh, it needs uh, some additional data to make sure that we also look at children who are residing in non-traditional house like household settings, because these surveys are designed uh, to uh, to reach the the household uh, level based children, right? So we need to look at institutions, prisons, uh, detention centers, orphanages, and whatnot. And the third, I think we need more and more longitudinal data in country uh, that follow the same individuals over time. And that will be able to show us not only uh, an impact of something of an intervention, for example, if you put that uh, as a part of the design, but also to show us what can make children who experience adversity emerge from, from life difficulties. So it can also show us resilience component, which I think is very, very important when we talk about prevention as well. Great, thank you very much. And yes, I, I cannot agree more that a big part of our problem is the completeness, but also the taking those that data and actually translating it into something that is, that is usable for, um, for policy. Um, before I go to Stella, I wanted to encourage all the participants to please start uh, writing your questions in the chat box, uh, and my colleagues will be will be sending them to me on on another device, so I can I can start asking once we're done with with this round of questions. So the the chat that is on the right side, you can click on the chat icon at the bottom that gives you the chat. Um, space on the right side and then you can type your questions you can either write a question specifically to one of the one of the panelists or you can write a general question and we will pose it to the entire panel um stella back to you um how do you see efforts to prevent harm to children in humanitarian linking to and contributing to wider so social justice efforts Thank you. Um, um, one is that uh, social justice efforts, uh, let, me, let me put it this way, humanitarian settings are part of the wider social justice agenda. The difference is that because of the complexities around the humanitarian setting, a lot of people, or we tend to distinguish the two, but they are an integral part of the same system. And therefore, to create the linkage between prevention efforts in the humanitarian setting and that in the social justice requires the need for all the stakeholders to ensure that the co there is coordination amongst um, the health, education, justice system, development organizations, civil society organizations, humanitarian agencies around this agenda. I also saw that the, 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 there was a question on the chat. Maybe I can just link this to that. It, it actually relates to, to the fact that, that the, the, the role of prevention or the role of action cannot be accomplished by one single agency. So the need for multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral coordination is very, very central in this aspect. And then the second one is also um, beyond just um, um, uh, multi-sectoral coordination is to ensure the, the requisite capacity to be able to respond and to, to work together. And, and that requires building capacity of all the, the stakeholders in the social sector, in the development sector, in the justice session, the wider social development sector to appreciate how, for example, to respond into the situation of, 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 of violence in the humanitarian setting. I'll just pick an example. If you take a, a helpline, a, a national child helpline, for example, a national child helpline is um, operational, operating in a normal context would probably look at 24 hours a day receiving calls and so on and so forth. But then when engulfed with an emergency like we had with the COVID situation, it then uh, puts the, the helpline at a situation where they require more or extra capacity to be able to respond. So preparedness, building capacity for them to be ready to respond and to take action as a collective is very, very important. The other one is also to ensure that the, the preparedness and response plans or prepare, disaster preparedness plans 
actually have the four or early warning system that is known to everybody, not just to the humanitarian workers, but then it becomes uh, something that is a, a, a given for everybody who is in the development sector. Over for now. Great. Thank you very much, um, Stella. I'll move on to, um, to Ken. Ken, I hope you can hear us. Um, how can we, as the international community, better support communities in proactive role vis-a-vis -vis children, in, in their, sorry, in their protective role vis-a-vis -vis children? Uh, thank you so much, Hani. I think as um, uh, an international community, uh, the only way, uh, in my view, how we can support uh, uh, communities better protect their children is to support in strengthening the already existing child protection system within uh, the community. In most cases, we often come with our, uh, our own designs, uh, our own community-based um, uh, protective systems, but in essence, what we do is that we end up creating parallel systems within communities that one, sometimes confuse them more, and number two, are not sustainable. And we often do not take adequate time to try and understand this community in terms of uh, the existing uh, uh, protective systems that can be either uh, uh, reignited or can be uh, strengthened and supported to better protect children because these are the systems that are with that are there in the community to uh, I mean that are part and parcel of the community so the issues of ownership and sustainability are somehow better taken care of if the systems are embedded within the community systems so uh, for me I have I have interacted with so many interventions that call themselves community-based, where well, in essence you find that they they come in with a prescription for the community to follow uh, to follow and develop a parallel system. And once we exit uh, the community as an organization, we exit with our uh, so-called uh, intervention, our so-called uh, community-based system. So the issues that we are grappling with in the child protection sector, issues of ownership, issues of sustainability are not addressed uh, with that kind of, uh, of approach or intervention. So in my view, we need to strive to be able to support community-based uh, systems and also endeavor to generate evidence around that so that we can share with uh, the whole sector as well as the donors and funders that actually strengthening community-based system and supporting community-based systems is also a very effective prevention uh, approach. It doesn't have to uh, be what we prescribe. Communities can also have a prescription or have a way or a system to protect their own children. Uh, thank you so much. Back to you, Hani. Thank you very much, Ken. And thanks everyone for, for these really um, deep reflections on, on some of these questions. Again, I think we'll leave here with more questions than answers, but hopefully the discussions throughout this week will, will help us come to some, some um, answers as well. Um, so we have several questions that have come in. I'll start by um, a question that has come from a colleague in, in the, the Congo uh, for Farida, uh, first of all, encouraging Farida and, and saying that you're doing a great job and asking how you linked to link to other, um, um, basically other Congolese who are working for the protection of, of children outside of outside of your country, country and how do you capitalize on, on everyone's work? Uh, thank you, Han, and thank you, uh, the participants who sent me this question. Um, let me say here in Stockholm, I've been here for six months, but uh, in Europe or outside the country in Uganda, um, we have, I have um, a, group, uh, a global youth 
a youth network called Green. It's a global refugee youth and started by us refugees. Um, a coordinator on a diversity, gender and diversity in the group. So we work together to see that we bring uh, different voices and you work directly uh, from our, from the local levels, because what I believe that in Europe or outside uh, in these 30 countries, uh, yes, there is protection issues, there is protection like child protection issues, but not wide as in the refuge communities or in the conflict areas or in the fragile areas. So what we do with Green, we try to support the young people, the RIROs, refugee youth led organizations from different communities to see that uh, we, pro uh, we, we develop their skills in child protection and the development of young people. Because uh, we get to know that uh, uh, mostly young people, we still have energy and we have skills, different skills, but what we need is to like a uh, capacity building to, to add on what we have to protect our communities. And we are willing to those who here in Europe, the Congolese, even not Congolese only, white, everyone who wish to see that refugee communities, refugee young people are, are, are doing a better job, a great job or doing their purpose in the local level in the refugee communities, not only even the refugee communities, but even in the host countries where we are, because we belong now, we belong there now. We don't belong to our countries where we reign from the conflicts, but we belong in the new communities where we are. So those who feels like they want to reach green, we will sh I'll share the link to learn more about what the work of green doing and how best we are protecting and in which areas are we supporting young people from different countries and different communities, not only Congolese refugees, but all refugees and green a partner partnership, they in partnership with the vision group. The vision group is my institution, which I started when I'm in Uganda in the refugee community, which are supporting young people and under protection of child, uh, children in the community. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And again, encouraging colleagues to, to post your questions in the chat. If, if even if you don't have time to answer them here, we'll encourage our speakers to answer um, within the chat function. Um, a question for Stella um, it says, thank you, Stella, for the great work. And I would um, like to get your views on how to balance prevention and service provision um, in our program, program priorities, particularly in humanitarian contexts with scarce resources. Basically, how do you balance prioritizing prevention versus response when, when resources are, are scarce? Over to you, Stella, or, and then anyone else after you who might want to comment. Um, thank you very much. Again, uh, I go back to the fact that uh, the analogy that I used earlier, that many a time we, when, humanitarian, when we are in humanitarian context, we are focusing on the forest and then get lost and forget the trees for the forest. I think uh, it's important that, yes, um, uh, we, we respond um, um, with the services that are needed at that point, but that is more or less um, putting a bandage on a wound that you know will, will, will heal temporarily, but not will heal, to will heal totally. So preventing us from reaching this point is actually important. With the scarce resources, that is where the, the, the multi-sectoral role comes into play tapping onto the potential of different stakeholders. As frontline workers, when I was a frontline worker in the humanitarian setting about more than 20 years ago, I did not have time to look at advocates or to engage even the, politi the politicians. My focus was on getting the resources to the people, getting the food items to the people, and that was what would be my preoccupation day in, day out. Now, the, the resources then, can, the, the limited resources we can, we can tap and leverage other stakeholders resources we get on to those that are engaged in advocacy we mobilize those that are engaged in frontline work and use each and everybody's potential to be able to to change the situation and context that you want to change so for me it's about 
working collab collaboratively, identifying different potentials amongst the different players and actors. And where there are no players and actors, drawing them on board. For example, drawing the donors on board, the donors that are supporting humanitarian work and telling them, look, we need to begin to engage beyond just investing here, but also looking at how we can prevent this from happening. So for me, it's about building the, the, the agency of the multi-sectoral agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stella. I guess I mean that the multi-sectoral element is one that that we we miss in the sense that um, it actually can be such a multiplier in terms of resources. So if you if you actually collaborate with other sectors in preventing, then the dollar amount that you have to put into response becomes so much less. Um, so bringing all of those sectors together and and um, and and it's not it's not that social protection is going to be investing in child protection. Social protection is going to invest in what they, they invest. It's just that when it's the design is targeted, you're almost um, benef double, double benefiting from it because you're achieving the, the objectives of the social protection, but are also achieving objectives of, um, of social protection. So great points. Um, one other question uh, to Ken. Did, Ken, did you observe discontent, disconnect, sorry, or conflict between formal laws, policies, particularly on child rights with informal community institutions, religious laws, tradition practices in the protection of children? Thank you, thank you so much, Hani. That's a very interesting uh, question and something that I've talked about uh, several times. So yes, I did observe that uh, disconnect or, or uh, conflict. So uh, first, first and foremost, let me start from a child rights uh, uh, perspective. So you find that uh, community members uh, understood child rights uh, differently. So for them, they saw child rights as um, a tool for uh, taking, taking not, uh, I mean, as a tool of, uh, of uh, taking away the parental control over their children. So uh, in most cases, uh, most of the community members were against um, any intervention that would talk about child rights. So in Africa, we say that children become uh, big headed or become more indisciplined. So there are so many examples of uh, parents saying, you know, um, when my child did something wrong and I tried to discipline my child, my child would would, would cry and shout, I know my rights, you can't beat me, you can't discipline me. Or children would report them to the police, then the police would come and arrest them. So they had that negative uh, association or perception of uh, uh, child rights. So uh, secondly is uh, uh, the government policies on, uh, on child pregnancies. So uh, the policies in Kenya said that if a child gets pregnant, then they should be allowed to go back to school. And so these uh, community members also felt that young girls exploited uh, uh, this policy. And so uh, some of the girls were uh, getting pregnant and allowed to go back to school, then they get pregnant again, going back to school, they get pregnant again, going back to school. So for the, I observed a lot of uh, conflict or tensions between laws and policies um, and uh, the community. So it's not only uh, the legal and policy framework, but also interventions on, uh, of, of some of the, 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 the stakeholders within those areas. So there were disconnects uh, as well as conflict that uh, uh, I witnessed. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting example that, that you gave that I've also seen in the work of uh, Dr. Mike, Mike Wessels in, uh, in other parts of, of Africa, in Sierra Leone specifically, um, that basically you, you give a tool, but the tool is not used in the right, right place. Uh, and then that creates this content about the tool, whereas the tool actually was not being, in this case, the, the issue of child rights. Um, there's another question, I think, targeted specifically to Stella, but of course, everyone is uh, welcome to comment. Um, Jason asks, what, do, uh, what to do in a region such as uh, Middle East and North, North Africa 
where several states are sources of worse violence, um, worse forms of violence against children. Um, do we think, uh, do we need to think more about regional analysis? Um, and if, he suggests that there is, there is a lot of uh, evidence on culpability in the Middle East. Um, Stella, first over to you, but anyone else who, who might want to comment on that issue as well. Yeah, um, um, I, I wouldn't agree with him more that him or her, sorry if I've gotten the gender wrong, but the, more about the, the, the complexities in the different regions. Um, uh, I think we have to acknowledge that the, the, the conflicts or the violence in the different regions play out differently and the intensity or the gravity differ, differs, especially the Middle East and even North Africa, we see more um, we see more of the, the youth, more of young people, more radicalism happening in, in, in all these regions. And that is not to say that um, we, we, we cannot um, uh, prevent that from happening. I think, I think prevention is still possible, but we, we, st we have to get back to how best we can engage all the stakeholders, especially the, 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 war, the warring factions. I know that for some for some um, organizations engaging with the war warring factions is, is illegal. But, but also it, it may be necessary, especially if we have to bring, um, to bring, to, to, to bring development into, into, into um, the, the, the conflict area. I'll just share an example. Again, going back to our experience working in Northern Uganda, it was more than 20 years when the war was raging and um, we reached a point where um, um, the, the conversation was more on response, dealing with the immediate, dealing with what was happening. Girls have been abducted, children have been abducted. This is what we need to do, give the supplies and so on and so forth. Until we decided to create the civil, organization, uh, civil society organization movement to engage and begin delving. And that is what Sanity talked about, delving into the root causes. What is this that is? causing this to happen because unless we deal with the root causes, unless we begin to engage and bring to light what is causing all this conflict and violence, we'll always be firefighting, we'll always be dealing with response, response, and response cycles, more response than the other. But I welcome other opinions from other people to-, to uh, Hani, can I add something to that, please? Sure, please come in. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it is a very important question, uh, relevant not only for the Middle, Middle Eastern context. From the social protection perspective, what we emphasize is that it is critical that social protection systems are built as adaptable. We call it adaptive social protection because when we do this, we can protect a country's human capital investment by building resilience and providing access to income earning opportunities so that vulnerable people don't fall deeper into poverty. And the, the, when you have a situation of fragility and crisis, and when you have the heat that impacts most vulnerable first, it is important that adaptive social protection is can be immediately activated to target those who need support the most. So this feature of adaptability is becoming very important for us, scaling up quickly, scaling down quickly. So we can work hand in hand with humanitarian partners and by doing it, using government system for that. And we have some good examples like in Niger when Adaptive Safety Net project provided 12 months of cash transfers to the most vulnerable, affected by crises in neighboring uh, Libya and uh, Nigeria. So, uh, so this, is, this is one thing. And the second thing I wanted to, I wanted to highlight that uh, during times of conflict, it's, obvious, it's obviously meeting humanitarian needs is crucial for saving lives and meeting basic needs. But protecting human capital is equally important for post-conflict reconstruction. So, so th 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 in the Middle East, there may be the time now to invest in adaptive social protection and in, um, in human capital. A good example, which I always give, is our project in Bangladesh, the Emergency Multi-Sector Rohingya Crisis, Crisis Response Project, because that project is strengthening the government of Bangladesh systems to improve access to basic services and build social resilience of the displaced Rohingya population. We try to do the same in, in Central African Republic. So two things, adaptive social protection and 
make investment in human capital and resilience in between the crises. And obviously, while doing all this, working together with other actors, especially humanitarian. That's the so, sort of roughly social protection reaction to, to operating in the, in the fragile and conflict situations. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Rutkowski. Um, I just want to kind of build on this and, and pose uh, maybe a last question to, to Santi, kind of throwing the ball back at you, Santi, of the first challenge that you gave us in, in the sense of when we talk about prevention, prevention can be done as, at so many different levels. You can talk about prevention at a very basic level, at the community level where you address Sim simple, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to downplay the complexity, but simple things like access to education, which might be resolved mm -hmm. with building a bridge. Um, then you go at a higher level, there are, there are social norms. Then you go at a higher level, there are these structural issues that might uh, be linked to some governmental policies. Then you do at, go at the global level, there's issues of, uh, of interventions that may result in, in interventions either of multinational organizations that uh, for example, the, the case of Congo is, is a very clear one that potentially fuels the violence or uh, interventions like in, in Yemen or in, um, or in other parts of the country, uh, parts of the world or Afghanistan, which now we're dealing with very, very clearly. Um, so all these levels ha have require actions to be done for us to prevent harm to children. Now, how do we connect all of these and what is the role of, of a, a community like the child protection community in addressing all of those? I think if I have the answer to that, I'll become the president of the world. Uh, so I don't have the answer to that, but I'm gonna make a, just a couple of comments as a reflection of, of that question, honey. And first, I think uh, the work of prevention is really, really difficult because as Stella mentioned, and also a couple of uh, participants uh, raised the same concern is that resources is, are always limited. Uh, and that's why evidence is supposed to be giving whoever making the decision, I'm not saying government because contexts are different, whoever making the decision to, uh, to be willing to uh, and uh, understand the, the value of investing in prevention. And that is sometimes uh, where people, through my experience I saw and witnessed, are making shortcuts because they also have obligation to show what they do. For example, parenting uh, support that, uh, that our colleague from the World Bank mentioned. I think that the evidence told us that cash, tra okay, that's cash transfers work, but uh, it works better if it's being accompanied by parenting support programs. And sometimes, and I witness in my own country, it's being translated into parenting trainings, which is not at all parenting support. It's basically shifting the blame to parents saying that if you don't understand child rights, then you know, uh, you're a bad parent. If you are uh, doing, uh, if you don't understand positive discipline, then you're a bad parent. So uh, parenting training is just one, just one bit of the whole parenting support. And it's basically require a government to invest in social workers, in making sure that social workers are trained, in making sure that social workers are available and uh, the, the, the case responses mechanisms are in place and accountable and ethical and being monitored and whatnot and so on and so forth. And sometimes people just take a shortcut and do not want to invest in the harder and more complex work, honey. Although the evidence has actually t told us to invest in something and it's being translated into something that is very superficial. For example, in Indonesia, our cash conditional, our conditional cash transfers are being uh, sort of married with a child rights, uh, like a family development sessions where parents are being taught about child rights. And of course, the impact is almost maybe nothing to, to child protection concerns. So that. And I think this, the, second, the second component that we often forget as a community, I think, is child agency. And where do children sit in this whole process and how do we give them uh, the voice and uh, enable them the dialogue to understand what decisions are being made and, and why from the community level to maybe uh, 
uh, the state level. The, the second comment I'd like to make is uh, maybe throughout this meeting, honey, uh, the colleagues here can think about what I mentioned in the beginning, my thoughts about prevention. And it's uh, just maybe I'm just thinking about this out loud. So if you see, if we see it as prevention works in quadrants and the X axis is like crisis is local and crisis is global. And then the Y axis is preventing the consequences and preventing the emergence or the onset of something that happening. And then you will see, I think it, it's going to be a very interesting discussion to admit and recognize that within those quadrants, there are interest, both national and global interest, hence investment. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I can only see that on the in the fourth quadrant here, where crisis is global, like climate crisis, and then uh, the prevention is to prevent it from happening in the first place. I think there's global investment there, uh, but not so much with mitigating the consequences to the more marginalized. It's not even global. It's sort of being handed over to uh, to countries. And of course, countries with more resources can mitigate it better compared to countries with less resources. I'll stop there. Great, thank you very much. That's a, I, I immediately drew it so we can we can dwell on it a bit more. Um, <clears throat> I'm, we're over time and I'm told by the producers that we have to close this. Um, can I just ask Stella and Ken who have their hands up to just come in for 15 seconds each, just the last final thoughts and, and then we close. And I apologize to the rest of the panel members. Uh, quickly, my final thoughts is basically, in addition to what Santi has talked about, is to look at uh, adapting and scaling up evidence-based solutions that are with us. We have the inspired strategies that can be adapted and, and scaled up in, and, and would be able to support the interventions of prevention across the three scales that you talked about, over. Thank you very much. And last words to Ken. Uh, uh, thank you. I just wanted to mention that uh, in my experience, sometimes um, uh, protective approaches is not much of a resource uh, per se. But I think the whole system is designed in a way that it is more responsive than than. Uh, uh, Sorry. Yeah, because uh, in terms of protection, it requires patience and require it requires a long term view. But I think most of the systems look into into the short, short term and are built to address issues at the short term. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank everyone, the, the panelists particularly, especially those who joined very early in the morning or very late in their evening uh, for joining us and sharing your, your thoughts. Please continue the discussion in the chat. There's some really interesting discussions happening there. Uh, so I encourage everyone to continue discussion there. We're going on a break and we'll be back in, I believe, 14 minutes from now. So in 14 minutes, we'll be back. Yeah.